Good evening from Sweden, Stockholm, where I'm based. Uh, and I'm a Swedish, so I've been the CEO for the company since uh, 2020. Leading Edge Materials, we're a Canadian public listed company. We trade on the venture under the ticker LEM. We're also listed on the OTCQB in the US. Uh, we also importantly trade in Europe under our ticker LEMSE on the Swedish Stock Exchange and in Frankfurt. As a Canadian company, I will share the uh, forward-looking statement disclaimer and get right into the, the strategy of our company and the project portfolio we have. So Gilbert introduced our strategy uh, very well uh, for the sake of time. I will run through the presentation fairly quickly because we have a number of very interesting projects. Uh, but I will start with uh, the graphite mine that we have in Sweden. It's uh, one of the few fully built graphite mines in the Western world. And we're ideally located to supply the European Union uh, and the industry there. Uh, we have four deposits on the mining leases. Uh, it's a fully built processing plant and all surrounding infrastructure. Uh, that plant can only produce a graphite concentrate. So what we've been focusing on is taking that graphite concentrate and upgrading it into a natural graphite active anode material that can supply the booming battery industry in uh, Europe. Last year, we released a preliminary economic assessment for that vertically integrated production of natural graphite. Uh, some fantastic economic numbers, uh, net present value at 8% of 248 million, internal rate of return of 37.4. Um, so uh, very, very positive numbers there. Uh, last year, in October, we also announced uh, non-binding plans for a joint venture with an Australian company for the next generation of animal materials, so silicon graphite composite animal materials. Um, our other project, uh, which is an even bigger project one and a more strategic one, is on rare earth. Uh, rare earth elements were discovered in Sweden only 20 minutes that direction from me here outside of Stockholm in, in the late 1700s. Um, it's taken a long time to actually industrialize those materials and China is leading that effort. However, our deposit is one of the world's uh, most significant heavy rare earth deposit. Uh, what I mean by heavy rare earth deposit, it's the even more rare rare earth element. So dysprosium, terbium, uh, and so on, and they all are used for permanent magnets. Uh, so which go into electric motors and uh, wind power. Um, we've released a PA last year as well. Some fantastic numbers there. Uh, three quarters of a billion post-tax MPV, uh, internal rate of return 26.3%. Uh, and uh, more importantly, we've redesigned the project of the last two years to a much more sustainable uh, layout of the project where we have a mine site and an off-site chemical processing plant. And we have a small exploration project in Romania for nickel and cobalt. We're waiting for an exclusive exploration license over having prospected, but we're optimistic that this is a potential discovery of high-grade nickel and uh, cobalt uh, mineralizations. Um, the company went through a change in 2020 with me coming on as a CEO. Uh, we put together a board of directors that is uh, much more focused on Sweden, where our main projects are located. So we have Lars Eriksson as the chairman. Uh, before becoming our chairman, he was the CEO of Ivan Home Mines, now a multi-billion dollar company, and he did that for more than 10 years. He, he's got an ex extensive experience in, Swe in the Swedish mining industry, and we're very pleased to have such an experienced mining executive on our board. Daniel Mayer is a very successful mining executive, CEO of another Toronto Venture listed issuer, Govix Uranium. Um, the largest shareholder, Eric, who's a Swedish citizen, is also on the board of directors. Uh, we have a high uh, proportion of insider ownership, so around 35%. Uh, and, and, and that's pretty much Swedish interest. So we got Swedish alignment across the shareholder base and uh, across the insiders and the board of directors. And then we have a, a small team of managers in Sweden, but we're a project development company. So we rely on our expert consultants uh, to a large extent so far. We have uh, 
this is a bit outdated. I think we're around 80 million Canadian market cap. Uh, we got 200 million shares fully diluted, 150 approximately non-diluted. Uh, we trade lately roughly 800,000 shares across our listings. Um, an important slide to look at our, uh, our funding needs. Uh, we have a num large number of warrants and options that are uh, far in the money that would be uh, our uh, most likely method of raising money as we as we cover our development plans going forward. Uh, with the warrants and options that are to, to a large extent held by insiders, uh, we could raise close to 10 million Canadian dollars. Critical raw materials, I won't go into this in detail due to time, but they're all linked to the industries and the, the various technologies that are the future of our society. Whether it's electric vehicles, and an electric vehicle has a battery, uh, it also has an electric motor to drive it forward. Uh, same thing with wind power, it has a permanent magnet generator, uh, you need uh, um, energy storage to store that energy from wind power. And these are the new materials. So whether it's graphite, rare earth elements, lithium, nickel, cobalt, uh, they're all going to be in the mall. So critical raw materials is the definition in Europe. Critical due to their economic importance, but also due to their supply risk. Supply risk, meaning that the supply at the moment is very concentrated. China has a very dominant position in, in the value chains of all of these materials. And uh, Europe is looking to become more self-reliant on the supply. And that's where our European projects uh, come into play. It's been very clearly stated by the, uh, by the president of the European Commission that we want to diversify our supply chains. Uh, and uh, we're looking to support that. So there's uh, the highest level of political support in Europe to develop projects like ours. So our graphite mine. It's uh, located in central Sweden, uh, and the map in the middle of that slide, you can see the number of battery factories that are being built in Europe. They're scattered across the place. Three years ago, this map would have been almost empty. We're now looking at an expected demand by 2030 of close to a million tons of anode material per year. There's almost no supply of anode material in Europe today, and no natural graphite. That's where our graphite mine comes into position. Uh, we're looking to produce a vertically integrated uh, from, so from deposit processing plant, offsite anode material factory. And then we can track that material straight down to continental Europe or in Sweden where a number of battery facts are being built to have an alternative supply compared with today where China dominates 100% of the midstream of processing of natural graphite for anode materials. Uh, where's the opportunity for us as a, as a listed company? All of these battery factories that you saw on the slide earlier, they're all getting funded, they're all going into production. But if you look on the upstream, so the raw materials and the active materials for the batteries, there's very much less funding and very much less plant capacity. So we're meeting the expected demand on the downstream, but on the upstream, there's going to be a huge supply gap, and we're looking to target that. The PEA, which can, it's a national instrument for 3101 document. It can be downloaded from our site. It's a 300 page document, which demonstrates the technical aspects and the economic aspects of this vertically integrated production of our natural graphite anode material. We have some few benefits that have, we have incorporated here in this PEA. Uh, we have access to hydropower uh, and which not only gives us a low cost of production in Sweden, but also very low carbon footprint which we demonstrated through a life cycle assessment. We're looking at an 85 to 90% reduction in carbon footprint compared with the current existing supply. This will be important as the European future customers make their supplier selections, but also when the European Union is looking to introduce carbon border taxes. So our value chain uh, looks like this. We have the mine, the concentrator, those are built and permitted. Uh, what we've been focusing our development on and our future uh, commercialization is the, the steps to upgrade that material to anode material. That we're doing either on our own 
or if it materializes our joint venture with the uh, Sicona, the Australian company. Here are a few pictures. Uh, not many companies, especially for graphite, can show that there is an existing processing plant and a mine site. Uh, it's a key advantage, especially when we look at graphite prices over the last 12 months. In Europe, graphite prices are up by 40%. It's due to the rising demand, but also to the supply chain and supply disruptions that we've seen over the last year. Not the least, the increasing uh, transport costs for sea freight. Our rare earth element project, it's a, it's a world-renowned heavy rare earth deposit. Uh, as I've explained before, these are really all about the permanent magnets. Permanent magnets that go into the electric motors and the wind power generators. That's where you're going to see the biggest uh, part of the market in terms of volume and the biggest supply gaps. Because to be honest, there's just not enough primary raw material supply where even China for disposal and terbium relies on imports for their downstream processing. If we look uh, in a global context, we're South Central Sweden, we have 350 kilometers to industrial ports and you know, there's a road down to continental Europe. But on a global scale, when we look at, there's a number of projects in North America, there's a number of projects in Africa, there's a, there are a number of projects in Australia, and in China, and in China, many of them are in production. But if you look in Europe, it's only really our deposit that is marked on maps like this. And that gives you a sense of the strategic importance for the European Union of our project. It's a, it's a big deposit. We have 100 mil, 110 million tons at a 0 0.5 uh, total rare earth oxide grade. We also have a lot of zirconium oxide, uh, niobium, uh, and nephilim cyanide, which is an industrial minerals product. Uh, if you compare with some of the world-class projects that are in production today, the contained amount of dysprosium in our project is, uh, is, is outstanding. And uh, comparing heavy to lighter earth oxides, we have more than 50% in our deposit, and that's quite unique. We've changed the design of the project. Uh, we're, we're now looking to do, uh, so going back from the PFS in 2015, where only the rare earth oxides were extracted. We're now looking to exploit more than 50% of the material that we mine, uh, which gives us a more solid project because we're, we're becoming really a sort of uh, multi-commodity project. Not only rare earth oxides, we have the nephilim cyanide as industrial minerals product, zirconium oxide and niobium oxide as well. At site, we only do mining, crushing, milling and magnetic separation. And then either it's sold as a product or it gets shipped off as a concentrate for further processing. This has reduced our footprint at site by close to 80% and it's going to facilitate the permitting of the project going forward. The financial numbers, I touched on them in the beginning. I think, again, here, look, download our technical report. Um, it's uh, also downloadable from our website. The numbers look fantastic and it's due to the sheer size of the project. And the rare earth prices, similar to graphite, have gone up significantly over the last 12 months. So if you look at current prices for rare earth oxides, they're much higher than the pricing that we have used in our preliminary economic assessment. An important factor here being in Sweden is the sustainability of our project. We're one of the projects that has the absolutely lowest levels of radionuclide content in the deposit. So we got 10 ppm approximately uranium and thorium, and that is a huge advantage when you consider uh, processing and associated waste and some of the hurdles other projects globally uh, that they are facing. Same thing here, access to hydropower and renewable energy gives us a very low cost of electricity. These are energy intensive industries and even more importantly, a very low carbon footprint of our potential production in the future. The exploration project, I wanna leave some time for questions. I might, I don't have a, a clock, but I think I'm around, we're running out of time. Uh, this is an exciting geological area. We're part of the Western Tethian Belt. It's a historic uh, mining area. There's a historic uranium mine within our perimeter. Uh, there's also a polymetallic historic mine in the perimeter. We've prospected waste dump outside of those galleries, which led us to apply for an exclusive exploration license, which has been delayed due to COVID, but we're hopeful that that will transpire during this year and we can launch an already defined exploration program, so giving some exploration upside. With that, uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, these projects, you know, the limited amount of time doesn't give them credit. 
we don't have that much information on our website. Uh, we, we're fairly active on Twitter, sharing news related to us, always uh, replying to emails coming into our mailbox. So happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, so a few questions here. The first one coming from Jake H for your Leonora project. So, so anything more that you think that you can improve on the existing PEA? Uh, which which of the projects? The Nora car. Yeah. So we've made some. We've made a few radical changes with the you know going from a PFS in 2015 to a PA in last year. Uh, so you know we've incorporated a new hydrometallurgical flow sheet. So we'd have to you know try. We've done pilot trials on that, but we'd we'd need our own pilot plan. I think I mean the the, the biggest opportunity is obviously the pricing. So we're looking at significantly higher pricing now, and all the forecasts are for prices to stay at these levels or even continue higher over the next five years. So you know that's a economic upside, uh, obviously. So yeah, I, I would say that's the biggest opportunity for us from an economic yeah. perspective. The second question coming coming from Tiana Chan is asking, who are your major shareholders? Are they mostly from Europe? So we have a we have a roughly 50-50 split. I've, I've been saying for the last twelve months. Uh, to be honest, our shareholder base in Europe is increasing on on behalf of uh, of North America. So recently, we crossed to being majority owned by Swedish shareholders. So you know, thirty five percent of the shareholdings is insiders, and we are Swedish. Uh, Eric Kraft, one of the directors, is, is the major shareholders with 33%. So he's very committed. He's not going to be able to sell in the near term. We're looking to get this project into production and to start unlocking the, the economic potential. Sure. Uh, one last question here from Larry Fu here. He's asking, do you uh, actually receive any some kind of uh, subsidies or grants from Europe in this kind of projects? No, it's, it's materializing. So you can see every region, you know, whether it's North America funding heavy rare earth separation plans, Australia just last week announced, you know, debt funding for project, debt funding for projects both in rare earth and graphite. Europe is uh, Europe's path is the European Raw Materials Alliance, and we're you know we're we're partner of that, and they've announced an action plan, and there's going to be uh, investment funds. They're looking at policy instruments as well, because to be honest, it's not the level playing field where you know some of the things in China are indirectly subsidizing the upstream of these value chains. And, you know, Europe is looking to do the same. It's, um, you know, we're trying to catch up. So investment and policy instruments are going to be beneficial for our projects. And there are not that many projects around in Europe like ours. Great. Looking forward to the continual advancement of that policy in Europe. Thank you for your time here, Philip, today. Super. Looking forward to next time, Gilbert. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you.